I want to thank all of you for taking time. I know it's post-busy season, and you're still uh, recovering uh, from busy season, so appreciate you coming out. Uh, before I introduce our guest of honor today, I want to review a, a couple of administrative items and details. First, I want to welcome those uh, uh, NJCPA members who are watching a live stream of this event on our website or our, fa or our Facebook. I also want to uh, welcome uh, our President-elect, Ed Guttenplan, who, uh, here, who's here today. Ed, uh, thank you, Ed. And also extend on behalf of our President Walter Brash's uh, our regrets for not being here. Um, like a lot of our members, uh, Walter is taking some uh, R and R, and is apparently, I think, in the air, but coming back from uh, South Carolina, doing one of his favorite things. The NJCPA, the NJCPA, excuse me, Don's going to get me for putting the S in there, is pleased to offer a forum where members can meet, listen, and ask questions of the candidates who are vying to lead our state, our state government. It is important to hear directly from them their views and ideas how to innovate, create, and grow our state, as well as the opportunity to express our concerns on the issues important to the CPA business community. Our guest today is, is New Jersey's Lieutenant Governor Kim Godonnell. She's currently been in that position for almost seven and a half years now. Yeah. Well, you know, yeah, we, I was going to say, you know, we, we're about numbers and, and things of that nature. But so, uh, and she is considered by many the front runner for the Republican nomination to su succeed Governor Chris Kirstie. For the next hour and, and change, uh, we're going to, or so, we'll engage in what we hope to be a very lively discussion and Q&A. Uh, following some opening remarks by the Lieutenant Governor, I'll pose several questions that have been prepared, which will take, uh, and we'll take questions from our in-person and streaming audience. So they'll be coming over. So if you see me looking at the laptop there, those are the questions that are coming in from, from the audience. If you wish to submit a question, please go to slide.com. The event code is hashtag 9210. We also have on the tabletops uh, cards there with, uh, th with that information. Questions will be forwarded to me, and I will ask as many as time allows. Out of respect for the Lieutenant Governor and, and her time schedule and your fellow audience members, please submit a question, not a policy statement or a comment or a dissertation. Uh, we will enroll you in a PhD. I know. We'll enroll you in a PhD program if you want to, you know, do, go that route. Lastly, while we encourage you to tweet and post and ask questions using your mobile phones and devices, we do request that you put them on mute uh, so that you won't interrupt the program today. With that out of the way, please join me in welcoming New Jersey's first Lieutenant Governor, Kim Guadano, to our forum. Before we get to our first question of the afternoon, let me provide you with some context about the New Jersey Society of CPAs. Altogether, there are more than 3,500 accounting firms and nearly 20,000 CPAs in our state. And the NJCPA has supported many uh, of their interests for over 119 years. We represent New Jersey CPAs and aspiring CPAs in public practice, business and industry, government, and education. Collectively, those professions serve tens of thousands of businesses of all sizes and millions of business owners, employers, and taxpayers. CPAs, in my opinion, and I think you hopefully will agree, offer a unique and valuable perspective and act as trusted advisors to help families, businesses, and organizations shape their futures. We appreciate the opportunity to pose a number of questions to you on topics that are important to the NJCPA, our members, and their clients and employers. So with that, Lieutenant Governor, why don't you take the floor to share with you, share with us why are you running for governor and tell us your vision to make the Garden State more competitive within the region and hopefully in the country. You can do this from the podium if you're more comfortable. Yeah. Uh, the podium's easier. Okay. Um, for me. All right. So right now, thank yeah. you. And then we'll just sit for the Q&A. Yeah. So before we get started, I think you need to know a little bit more about my biography and my background because all of you are thinking as a lieutenant governor, I'm a, I'm a political hack who's 
come up through the ranks of politics, and I, I need to debunk that myth okay. right now. Um, I actually moved around the country all my life, um, up until the time I got married and moved to New Jersey. I moved from oh, Iowa, Michigan, Indiana, Connecticut, Indiana again, Ohio again. That was twice, I think I said it. Pennsylvania, D.C., and, and about 20 different places before I went to college. I went to college at Ursinus College in Pennsylvania, and I went to law school in Washington College of Law in, in D.C. And to put the year in perspective without giving away too much, um, it was the year I was sitting at, the year I was sitting in my first property class. Um, Ronald Reagan was shot in D.C. So that makes me, yes, about 58 years old, and uh, I have three children all of them born and raised in New Jersey because when I left law school, I went to the Southern District of New York and practiced as a law clerk for two years, and then I spent about five years paying off my student loans in a big firm by the name of Kay Scholler. At the time, it was Kay Scholler, Fearman, Hayes, and Handler in Midtown Manhattan. It's now on the west uh, side on 7th Avenue, and it's now called Just Plain Kay Scholler. And then after that, I finally got the job of my dreams. Imagine going home and telling your parents the job of your dreams is, I'm going to be a federal prosecutor doing organized crime and racketeering cases in Brooklyn, New York. Um, that is exactly what I did, and I did it for about eight years. That's where I met my husband, who was born and raised in New Jersey. And when we decided to get married, we moved to New Jersey, where he was born and raised, Monmouth County. I know Wall, Wall is in the house, which is good. And um, I went over to work for first Sam Alito, who is now a Supreme Court Justice, and then Michael Chertoff, who was a Third Circuit Judge, and then later became the head of Homeland Security. I, did, I was in charge of a deputy, I was a deputy in charge of uh, public corruption cases. So those of you who might have known Tom D'Alessio, who was the Essex County Executive back in the early 90s, I prosecuted him to conviction and 46 months in prison. And then um, another more notorious one was Nick Bissell, the Somerset County prosecutor, who we prosecuted but never put in prison because he fled before he shot himself in a hotel room in Las Vegas, Nevada. So just to give you that kind of background so you know that I didn't grow up thinking I would be standing here ever, first of all, not as Lieutenant Governor of New Jersey, but also as a candidate for governor in New Jersey. I grew up wanting to be a lawyer. And that's what's colored everything I've done ever since. I got involved in politics many years later, in 2005. Um, after I found something in my town that bothered me and I remembered that I was a litigator and I could do something about it. So 2005, I became the commissioner in the little tiny town of Monmouth Beach. I was the trash collector. It was my job to keep the roads clean and I did for two years until I got a chance to be the sheriff of Monmouth County. And I know we have at least one wall person in here, but for those of you that don't know what a sheriff is, it's the highest elected law enforcement official in each one of the 21 counties. There's one sheriff. Um, and in Monmouth County, the responsibilities included 700, um, about 650 law enforcement officers, including a 1,300 bed facility, which was the 10th largest um, jail of its kind in the country, um, 370, 365 days a year, seven days a week, uh, 110 law enforcement officials on the ground. He also protects judges in the jails and served warrants like domestic violence warrants and child support warrants. I also ran the 911 communication center for the, sh for the county and also ran the youth detention center for the county. And I did that for two years before I became the the first lieutenant governor of New Jersey. You didn't miss anything, really. It, in 2005, I was trying to teach some, give somebody something to walk away with, a little bit of, bit of history, um, because somewhere in all of that background, I also taught at Rutgers Law School for eight years um, at night in, their, in uh, Rutgers Law North now, but it was Rutgers Law Newark at the time. I always like people to walk away knowing something they didn't know before. So in 2005, someone in this room voted to create the office of Lieutenant Governor. The first time there ever was an office was in 2009 when John Corzine asked Loretta Weinberg to run with him and Chris Christie then, a former U.S. attorney, asked me to run uh, with him and, and the Republicans won in the last seven and a half years. I've been the Lieutenant Governor of New Jersey. And what's relevant to you now is that as Lieutenant Governor, the Governor back in 2009, when he announced, even before he knew who his Lieutenant Governor was going to be, he wanted his Lieutenant Governor to take care of the crisis at the time. 
And if all of you think back to 2008 and 2009, you'll remember that the crisis of the time was that our economy was completely in free fall. Uh, we had 9.8% unemployment. We had about 117,000 private sector jobs that had literally fled the state in that one year of 2009. And we were basically at the top of the Great Recession or the bottom of the Great Recession, however you look at it. And we were, we were in free fall. So he wanted his lieutenant governor to be in charge of creating jobs. So when I was elected, we did a study. We figured out what the best way to create jobs were in New Jersey. Where were the areas that we saw growth for the 21st century? We commissioned an objective review of where we thought the 21st century jobs would be. It, and we then went after those jobs. So in New Jersey, because of the high cost of living, we weren't going to be able to get the regular manufacturing jobs. All of you know those regular manufacturing jobs left the state of New Jersey. But we also knew that high-tech manufacturing, because of its location and co-location with pharma, life sciences, and biosciences, biopharma sciences, was a growth area for us. So we targeted six areas based on the review we conducted. We set up a private-public partnership called the Partnership for Action, and we started to market New Jersey heavily outside of New Jersey. We went to New York and started fighting for all those jobs that New York had stolen from us over the years. We went to Pennsylvania and did the same, but we also went around the world, not on your tax dollars, but through a private public partnership that was geared specifically towards targeting those jobs that we thought would fit better here in New Jersey. Um, while we were doing that, I started to visit every CEO I could get my hands on in the state. I sat down the last we counted um, with 800 COOs or CEOs. That's one every three days in face-to-face -face interviews talking to these people COOs and CEOs about what their challenges were. Because you can tell by my background, my background was in the law. It was not in economic development. It was not in fighting for jobs. It was fighting for justice. It was fighting for victims. But it wasn't fighting for those jobs that we had saw, seen flee the state of New Jersey. And what I had seen and what I heard directly from them was really quite simple. People couldn't afford to live here anymore. They couldn't afford to die here anymore, and they were out of here, quite frankly. So we went to the governor with what we found after speaking to all of these people and said two things. First, you have to make it objectively reasonable for companies to stay here again, and you have to make them feel welcome. So over the last eight years, you've seen a $2.3 billion reduction in business taxes, and you've seen me reach out to hundreds if not thousands of companies to make them feel welcome again through what we call the Red Tape Commission. We've cut regulations in New Jersey by approximately 60 percent. Um, we went from 7,000 pages in 2009 presented by a prior administration to about 2,000 today, which should cause you as accountants some concern is that somebody actually counted those pages and you probably paid them to do that. But that scares me a little. But the point is that we actually reduced the number of regulations that made it hard for businesses to do work in New Jersey. And that all impacts you. As you sit here today, there is no doubt in my mind that you are thinking the following. Well, she missed this one. And just fill in the blank. So the, the uh, Red Tape Commission is still meeting and will be meeting through January 2018. It's not too late. Um, I don't know how many of you have my cell phone number, but we will go, th go add that at the very end because okay. that's just what we do. Um, and uh, you could actually Google it and now pull it up, I'm told. But what I'm trying to explain to you is what my record was for the last eight years. And, and because you are number crunchers, you need to know, objectively speaking, how those numbers are working out. So these are not my numbers. I, I wish you would believe my numbers, but these are Washington's numbers. And what we have seen over the last eight years, because we lowered the business taxes in this state and because we reached out to companies and made them feel welcome again in this state, we've seen unemployment go from 9.8% to 4.2%. That's a good two points below the national average. Now, I know most people don't believe that. I know most people don't feel that. I know when you talk to gubernatorial candidates, it doesn't really fit their narrative that the world is coming to an end and we need change. 
But those are the numbers, and we got there by talking to people like you. I'll give you one example. The COO of Subaru called me on a Sunday afternoon in the summertime. Everybody know Tom Dahl. If you live down south, you know Tom Dahl. And we have since become uh, friends. But at the time, he called me on the phone and he said the following. And I had never met him, and he did not introduce himself. But he got my cell phone number, and this conversation went pretty much like this. We can't afford to live here. We can't afford to die here. Don't you know I'm the only automobile manufacturer company whose headquarters is here in New Jersey? And I'm leaving New Jersey because of some arcane accounting rule that made it impossible for Subaru to stay here. Literally, the conversation then went like this. Time out. It's Sunday afternoon. I can't do anything to help you today. But what I can do is walk across the hall on Monday, speak to the treasurer, and ask him if this is, in fact, an arcane outlier that New Jersey needs to change. Fast forward six months, we change the rule. Their lead certified distribution center is in Burlington County instead of Pennsylvania. And then fast forward three years after that with some credits, some business tax credits, their new world headquarters is no longer um, on its way to Atlanta, Georgia, or some other uh, facility, but is already being built right now in, of all places, Camden City. All because I answered the phone. And all because he brought to my attention an arcane accounting rule that made it impossible for him to do business here. Now that's my record. And I'll rely on that record going forward. I think it's a record that's tested. I think my record as being lieutenant governor for the, for the last eight years is a record that I am proud of and is one I can run on. But I think we need to do more than that. And that's where we're going to turn the corner and flip the channel a little bit and say, well, why are you running for governor now? Why not just walk away? The economy is, is still struggling, some would say. The uh, pensions still have structural defects. The school funding formula has still resulted in a raise, rising um, pressure on um, these uh, property taxes in New Jersey. We still have the highest foreclosures in the state. We still have the highest property taxes in the state. I could go through all of the problems we have yet to fix, but let me point out that that was not my problem for the last eight years. My problem and my mission was to keep jobs here. And I, let me add one last thing before we do change the subject a little bit. The best thing that happened to New Jersey in terms of job creation was the mayor of New York City, Bill de Blasio. Because we've literally been able to go to the large companies in New York City and say the following, look, we need you to move across the river. It costs about a third to move to Jersey City. The view is much better from our side of the river. And there is no hope for you in terms of job growth in Manhattan. And as a result, you will see the unemployment numbers in Jersey City and Hoboken and even New York be uh, having downwardly spiraled, spiraled, quite frankly, for the last seven years. And the best thing that ever happened to us was New York. I'm, you know, they've been stealing from us for years. I'm happy to steal a few back. So why am I running for governor? Because in those eight years, I've had a chance to travel this state, I would guess, hundreds of thousands of miles in a car, quite frankly, that you pay for. Um, meeting people. Because, you know, companies are made up of people. It's not just a business, and it's not just a structure. I don't need to tell you as CPAs. These people constantly tell me that, yes, I can now find a job in New Jersey, but I can't afford to live here. I can no longer afford to raise a family here. I can no longer afford to retire here. So my campaign is simply about one thing, and that is affordability. We need to wrestle the highest property taxes in this country to the ground. And I know people don't think we can do it. But I also know, having seen how government works for the last eight years, that if you have, as governor, 
the number, pri number one priority in your campaign and in your administration, reducing property taxes in this state, it will happen. People said we couldn't put a 2% cap on property taxes. We did it. Now, the problem with it is everybody's found a way around it. Everybody finds the loopholes, and in this room you know what I mean. And property taxes, while they went down originally and stayed under the 2% cap, they're now rising above the 2% cap because we are all um, ingenious and we find ways around it. We need property taxes that actually go down. I know we still have problems with pensions. I know we still have problems with um, keeping our economy moving. But the number one problem, if you ask anyone in this state, you will get the same answer. My school property taxes need to go down. I can no longer afford it. So I propose two things. First, an immediate fix, one that we can work on, one that I believe Republicans and Democrats alike can get on board with, because it helps the people who need the help the most the fastest. Our senior citizens need to know that on their fixed income, their property taxes aren't going to continue to creep up. They need to know what the number is. And the number under my circuit breaker plan is set quite simply this, 5% of your household income, whatever that is, if it's lower than your property tax rate, you will get that money back from the state. And the state, for all of those who, of you who might be in government right now or might be on boards of education, the state will reimburse you. If you're a, a family, a working family, one who lives paycheck to paycheck, one who's about to lose their home, or one who's in the middle of the foreclosure crisis that we're seeing now in New Jersey, you will now know that you will never pay more than 5% of your household income for your school property taxes. Or millennials who are coming to New Jersey to find one of those jobs, who are still living in the basement of their parents' homes because they can't afford not to buy a house, they can afford the house, but there's no guarantee of a fixed amount in terms of the property taxes because they continuously creep up. My plan is really quite simple. Give them a hope, give them the promise that their property taxes will never be more than 5% of their household income. Now, that's not going to help everybody. We've, we estimate based on 2000, the 2010 census, I can get wonky in this room, right? So based on the 2010 census, we estimate that it will be about a million to a million and a half people who will immediately benefit from this immediate property tax solution. It wasn't my idea. It was actually a liberal think tank's idea. Of course, now they're criticizing it because now they can't, now it's not their idea, it's my idea, and they get upset about it. But the idea is really quite simple. When you hit that number, you trip a circuit breaker and the lights go off. You don't have to pay any more money. That's the short-term fix. That's the immediate fix. That's the lifeline to the seniors the middle class working people, and the millennials that want to stay here in New Jersey. The second piece is a longer term fix. And everybody is talking about in this election, the real generator of high property taxes in New Jersey is a school funding formula. I saw the Senate president today promise that he was not going to get a budget to the governor's desk if we didn't fix the school funding formula. Would you have, 10 years ago or 8 years ago, thought that a Democrat would stand up and say, we're not putting a budget on this governor's desk unless we finally fix the inequities in the school funding formula? That should give us all hope. Because we all know there are inequities in the school funding formula that need to be fixed. And I, I'm hopeful that the Senate President sticks to his guns on that one, because if we do fix that, then we will fix the driver, the long-term driver of property taxes in New Jersey. And if we fix the long-term driver of property taxes in New Jersey in a way that will survive Supreme Court scrutiny, then we will be able to fix all of the other problems in New Jersey because our economy will take off. People will stop living in Pennsylvania. They will come home. People will stop moving to, Pen to New York or Delaware. They will come home because they will be, be able to find good quality jobs and, more importantly, afford to live here again. So that's why I'm running. Quite simply, only one issue. A lot of other problems, don't get me wrong, I've been around long enough to know there are a lot of other problems and I'm going to leave you to ask those Q&A and see how I would solve some of those. 
But quite frankly, I believe that we need to start to fight the fight against the number one driver of taxes in New Jersey. It's school property taxes. My plan is the circuit breaker plus long-term fix to the school funding formula. I believe that plan will work if you have someone who is willing to fight for it. And I know that if we fight for it, the most powerful governor in the state in, in this country can fix it. Now there's others. We want to audit Trenton, save a lot of money, stop the waste. You all, in some form or another, um, audit, do audits. Um, I'm talking about performance audits. If we don't need that extra person in transit, get rid of that extra person in transit. Governor Kane did it in, two, in 1983, saved $100 million. We estimate fast forward, we could save a quarter of a million dollars. We need an independently elected attorney general. My whole life has been in law enforcement. If we don't have an independently elected attorney general like 43 other states do, then you will not have confidence in your government anymore. And I believe in New Jersey, one of the reasons why people's attitudes and um, outlook on our future is so low that we're going in the wrong direction is because they don't believe our elected public officials anymore can do their jobs. An independently elected attorney general with the proper guidelines and, re and restrictions. For example, let's make it a seven-year term so it, over, so it crosses over administrations. Let's make sure they don't spend more than $10,000 in a campaign. Imagine that. And let's do one last thing. Let's make them promise never to run for governor. What do you get then? You get a law enforcement official who's simply focused on making sure you get your money's worth. And I believe it's time for that in New Jersey. It's well past its time in New Jersey. And I think that will solve a lot of the problems we see, not just in the everyday operation of our government, but a lot of the problems I see in your faith in our government. So I'm going to end, because I know I talk too long and you want to ask a lot of questions. <laughs> I'm going to end like this. I believe that one last thought should convince you to vote in the primary if you can, but also to vote in November. One party rule in this state will ruin this state. What do I mean? We have a nice check and balance right now. We have a little fighting going on in Trenton. I might not be doing that when I become the governor of this state, but I will provide a check and a balance. The Democrats control the legislature. We need someone in Drumthwacket who's able to negotiate with those Democrats but also to stop some of the things that some of you have heard some of the other gubernatorial candidates would do if they take over in Trenton. That will ruin our economy. Anyone who says that we can afford more taxes in this state has not talked to the businesses that are all of your clients right now like I have. You will throw a wet blanket on it, we'll go backwards, and we will. We will not be better off than we were b before. So thank you for letting me give my uh, way too long introduction. And now I will sit down and let you ask the hard questions. OK. Sounds good. OK. And we'll pull it around. I wonder how you're going to do that. <laughs> it's magic. So, you talked about the circuit breaker and taxes. Our first question is on taxes. Now, according to a 2016 study conducted by the Tax Foundation, New Jersey has one of the worst tax climates of any state in the nation. As governor, would you propose any major tax changes beyond the breaker for individuals or businesses? Well, we, we've already, as I said, uh, recommended $2.3 billion worth of tax um, cuts for the state of New Jersey, and they worked. Um, so what we need to look at now, I believe, is how we can help individuals. So beyond the circuit breaker and fixing the school funding formula, right now I would not. Um, there's always a loophole or two that needs to be fixed and cleared up. But right now I think business taxes have been cut enough. Um, at least uh, in, if, unless there's an outlier. 
and I'm, and I'm looking to this room, if there's an outlier, there's a couple of things we should be talking about. If there's an outlier, are we the, like for example, when we rolled out the single sales factor in New Jersey, it was because I sat down with a company called Church and Dwight, which is Arm and Hammer, Hammer. Ba Arm and Hammer Baking mm -hmm. Soda or OxyClean. Um, and they told me the reason they were leaving the state of New Jersey is because the single sales factor was killing us. Now, it took us four years to roll it out uh, because it was so expensive tax-wise, revenue-wise, um, but we rolled it out. If there's someone in this room who knows there's another tax that's keeping us or another uh, problem that, like that, the single sales factor, we were an outlier, and literally um, tr Jim Craigie was leaving. He had, he had already bought a lead certified distribution center in Pennsylvania. Um, he was taking his entire company, Arm & Hammer, to Pennsylvania. Um, he did not because I asked him, like Tom Dahl, give me six months, and I promise you if I can fix it, I'll let you know, and if I can't, then we'll go f friends. His new world headquarters is in Ewing, uh, Ewing, Mercer County, and he took his old research and development facility, um, put a couple of hundred million dollars in it and changed that, and instead of closing his manufacturing facility in Lakewood, um, grew that out also. So the answer is I think we've done enough on business taxes for now. Clearly the, the economy has spoken in that way. Um, but I think that the real problem we have right now, as you've heard already, is we need to fix property taxes so we can stay here and grow our families here and, and keep our millennials, our next generation here. Sticking on the tax topic, and you've talked about uh, business taxes, there's been a lot of conversation about bringing back the millionaire's tax. What Not from me. Well, okay. And <laughs> uh, so... From that standpoint, you would oppose a millionaire's tax? Because I, I there's take, been a conversation about uh, imposing a millionaire's tax as a, as a way to help address the pension obligation. And that's uh, not going to Quinnip work. Quinnipiac just did a survey. Right. Um, which they, I guess the results were 60% of those surveys said they would be in favor of that. Subsequently, we did a survey amongst our members because we feel that they have their, pul their fingers on the pulse of Sure. All taxpayer constituencies, and it, sixty percent said they would not favor that. So, right. So, 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 the interesting part about it is that I'm the only major party candidate who is against increasing taxes. Um, one of my colleagues, whom I'm in the primary with, has said he wants to increase the tax brackets, and has has told the NJ.com that he will increase our taxes six hundred million dollars. That's the millionaire's tax. Mm -hmm. um, and, I, and I know that the leader on the other side has also said the same thing. And I think all, actually all four people on the D side have, have said they would uh, institute the millionaire's tax. Let me tell you what will happen when that happens. The same thing that happened in, in 2009 when John Corzine did it. You will leave. You will leave. <laughs> And the evidence isn't coming from me. The evidence is from the numbers themselves. We lost 117,000 private sector jobs in the year that we had that extra tax on or extra corporate business tax. Interestingly enough, the, the Democrats, when they had a chance to, it sunsetted, when they had a chance right before we were elected to raise it again, and in other words, to keep it in place, um, when John Corzine was still the governor and the Democrats still controlled the legislature, they did not do that. And I will tell you why they did not do that. Because they know if you put a tax on the most taxed people in this country, people will leave. Because people have choices. They can move right across the river to New York, where in some, in some places it's still cheaper to live, or you can move to Pennsylvania or Delaware or Maryland and commute. Um, people have far too many choices. We are far too mobile. We can work at home. Um, we cannot afford to tax the most people, the most tax people in this country, uh, no matter uh, whether it's a millionaire's tax or, uh, or any other kind of tax. Well, it, it really, back in when it was implemented, was a tax that started with adjusted gross income of 400000 and it escalated up. Well, yeah, then, so since when are the millionaires <laughs> 400000 and up? I, of course, I don't meet that threshold either, but um, so I'm not speaking for myself. I, 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 the tax would not hit me, but it will hit it will hit others. I think period. No more taxes. Enough. For, you, you have to solve your problems in another way. And in New Jersey, if we've learned nothing 
over the last eight years. You have to solve your problems in another way, and that is to sit down, negotiate changes to the school funding formula so that the school funding formula is not so inequitable. Okay, thank you. And I, I'm just going to interrupt one point. I meant to uh, congratulate you on your, uh, the fact that Joe Piscopo has now <laughs> endorsed you. Uh, for those of you who don't know, this morning uh, on uh, we had his surprise. We had a surprise. surprise Everybody yeah. thought he was going to declare for, for governor, and, uh, and instead he endorsed me because we think alike. And, and what do I mean by that? I think elections have to be hopeful. I think we should be talking about tomorrow. I think we should be talking about what we're going to do to make our lives better and, and how our lives can be better. And, and Joe thinks the same thing. Um, he was very frustrated. I think that was why he wanted to get in. He was a Democrat. He was a pro-Trump um, independent. Uh, I think he wanted to get in for many of the same reasons um, I got in. And, and we sat and chatted all day so for a couple of hours on Saturday and found that we had a lot of things in common. We want to fix our cities. We want to find a place for our millennials to live, in which we know is, is our cities. Our, our, is our cities. Um, so I was very proud to get his endorsement today. Thanks for good. mentioning that. Well, congratulations that was a good on that. That was a good commercial. <laughs> Speaking of commercials. Oh, okay. <laughs> I'm on the air today, too. Our first commercial is up. Sorry. Right. Shameless opportunist. <laughs> So back to your, your circuit breaker, which you introduced on or made public on April 19th um, and, and what it's designed. One of, some of the comments or criticism have been that this will create a, a $1.5 billion hole in the budget. And I guess uh, and with that price tag, how do you close that gap? Or what's your plan? What would be your plan to close that gap? You know, only Republicans actually go back before they make a proposal and run the numbers. So we did take all of the numbers from 2012, took all of the median numbers, and took all of the um, school property tax rates, and we ran the numbers to find out how much money this was really going to cost us, and then to try to figure out if it was too much. So we ran 6%, 5.5%, and 5%. We thought, based on my um, experience, that 5% we could handle. It was one, one, somewhere between 1% and $1.5 billion. And we, we could only use the 2010 numbers because that was right. the only time the census was available. And the $1.5 billion sounds like a lot, except when you consider it's a $35 billion and change um, budget, except when you consider we could stop the state house renovations at $300 million, except when you consider that we estimate, and it is an estimate, that we could save a quarter of a million dollars, a quarter of a billion dollars in just simply streamlining government through the audit, except when you consider that over the last three years we've given out $3.9 billion in tax credits to businesses, except when you consider if we just got rid of the sick leave, that's $2 billion worth of savings, or if we just tinker with the health care benefits for the pensions, that's another estimated, reported anyway, I didn't run the numbers, I got it out of the newspaper, another $2.5 two So there's a number of different buckets we could get that money in, but that's not so much the issue as is the will to do it. You know, People talk and complain about property taxes every day. I don't know anybody that can't, when you go to dinner, you, you ask anybody what the biggest problem is, and they're going to tell you um, property taxes. And you need someone who's finally going to say, I'm going to fix it. Your property taxes, at least for the group of people that need it the most, will go down under this program. And we will find a way to pay for it. And that's why I say people say we couldn't do the 2%. People say we couldn't get pension and health care benefit reform. People say we couldn't get arbitration reform. They couldn't get tenure reform. We did all of that in the last. Couldn't get a $2.3 billion business tax reduction over the last um, eight years. We did all that. Or we could use other examples. Um, Jim McGreevy couldn't fix the high cost of automobile <coughs> insurance. He did that. Why? Because that was his number one issue as governor. Christy Whitman, another one, 30% the reduction in state income tax in three years. She did that. Why? Because that was her number one issue. We need a governor whose number one issue is going to be to address the number one issue in New Jersey, property taxes. And that's the way to do it. I'm going to take a question that came from the audience, uh, which is uh, eight years later, what industries do you think will lead the economy in New Jersey for the next eight years? Any IT to answer the question, what's going to lead the economy in the next eight years? So there are six buckets. 
um, six and a half, depending on how you, you look at it. And uh, so you have travel and tourism. That is the third largest industry in New Jersey. It does generate $43 billion worth of revenue for the states. That's a growth industry, but probably only 1% or 2% a year. Um, and it will always be here because we have 127 miles of the be most beautiful shore in the country. And I can say that because I run the Division of Travel and Tourism as the Secretary of State. So um, that's one. But pharma, life sciences, they're coming back. People don't talk about it anymore um, because what they've turned into is generics. So we are now becoming the generic capital of the world. Um, and Allergan, which used to be Watson, which used to be activist, is now one of our largest generic um, performance uh, uh, t um, businesses in the, in the state. So pharma life sciences is always going to be our life's blood. Um, finances, financial services is always going to be a growth area for us. Um, Health care is always going to be a growth industry for us. Logistics, especially now that the Transportation Trust Fund has um, been passed, is always going to be a growth industry for us, especially because we're so perfectly located between New York and um, D.C. And, and for those of you who don't know, on one tank of gas, even back in the days when gas was really expensive, you could get to $3 trillion worth of disposable income from where we are right now, which is why the industrial set, um, distribution centers down by eight and seven are, are going gang fire. You can't buy gangbusters. You can't buy a, a space there anymore, um, which is why Amazon is here with 20,000 jobs, which is why Blue a Apron is here with 2,000 jobs, because we are so perfectly located between New York and, and, and we have access to $3 trillion worth of disposable income. So the last frontier has got to be, uh, I might have forgotten one, but it has got to be Internet. We have um, the most connected state per square mile than, than anywhere in the country because of our history. You know, whether it's AT&T or Alcatel Lucent or Verizon, we're very well connected and we're beginning to sell that. And like in Newark, for example, you, could, you have Wi-Fi anywhere you want in Newark. Who would have thought? Audible.com is in Newark for just that reason. It recently, well, not recently, a couple years ago, bought by Amazon. So um, I'm very hopeful that people will come here because of how close we are to a large population with a large amount of money to spend. But also, we have more scientists and engineers in New Jersey than any place else in the world per square mile. We have a very, very educated workforce. Um, and, and I know everybody say, really? We have more scientists and engineers than any place else in the world per square mile? It's true. It must be true. The Star Ledger fact checked it and said it was true, so it has to be true. <laughs> so um, we have a lot of talent here, and and we have a lot of assets here. The problem is none of them, none of those people can afford to start their lives here um, because it's just too expensive. And before I go to my next on the talent issue, um, New Jersey is often referred to as one of the largest exporters of high school seniors out of the country. Those individuals leave and go other places, and data suggests that around 65% of them never return. What do you see, uh, what would you do to change that? Three things. First, you have to remember what we've done already. $1.6 billion in a higher ed bond. Um, most of the facilities that money went to is the first uh, contribution. First investment in higher ed, and you all voted on it. Um, vote, first investment in higher ed since Governor Kane was the governor. And we have um, spent billions of your money going around and creating seats for STEM, um, mostly for STEM at our public education, higher ed institutes of higher education. So you're going to see a lot of people stay here because we're now investing in our infrastructure. As, uh, in terms of buildings and things like that. That's the first thing. Second thing is we need to make it affordable. I'm back to the affordability again. They're not staying if they can't come back here and earn a living wage and pay their bills. They don't want to live in their parents' houses. I wish they would. I have two older ones. I wish they would. But it, we really have to get back to the same old problem. We really finally have to address the property tax problem. It's not jobs. We have the jobs. We're at 4.2% unemployment. You guys are CPAs. Some of you are economics majors. You know that 5% is considered a robust economy. We're at 4.2. We have more people working in New Jersey right now than in the history of the state, period. 
not the 80s, not the 90s, more now than ever before in our history. So it's not because they can't find jobs. It's because they can't afford to live here. Okay. One of the big issues that was on the table last year was the whole pension obligation. And in fact, it was almost uh, ended up on the ballot in November. Um, I'd like for you to address, would you ever entertain the pension obligation being on a ballot to mandate specific payments to the pension? Oh, that ballot question. That ballot question. The one that almost bankrupted Illinois. That ballot question. Yeah. You, know, you all know in Illinois, if <laughs> they mandate full pension payments. So in Illinois, there's a Republican governor there now who absolutely refuses to sign the budget. So they haven't had a budget in, in almost I think, three almost years. three years three now. Years I was going to say two years now because they can't make the pension payment. Um, I would never sign. I would never recommend. And, you know, if you're, if you're doing a ballot question, the governor can't stop it. But you can certainly campaign against it. Um, if we had to make that, we're already making four payments a year. It's what those payments are. Uh, the next third rail of government, you know, these 11 downgrades have all been the result of the inability to fully fund the pensions. Not everyone's, or, or let's, I was going to say it's not anyone's fault. Let's put it the other way. It's everyone's fault, you know. Uh, the governor after governor of both parties have failed to make full pension payments. This year, though, we've made $2.4 I think, is the number that's in our proposed budget. Um, with with a recommendation that from the bipartisan pension commission that if we just tinker with the health care payments, in other words, move from what we are still calling the Cadillac version mm -hmm. down to the gold version, we could save about $2 billion. Take that two, put it in the pension. You've, you're almost at a full pension payment right there. Um, so there's a, and the governor in his state of the state suggested selling the lottery or putting the lottery into the pension to make it, um, to give it more assets, uh, to give it more, um, yeah, assets, to move it from 49% to 65%. Um, that's got to be unwound or wound up, depending on, they're still negotiating that. I hope they do that, because if you can go from 49 to 65, we won't continuously see downgrades. And if we don't see downgrades, you all know better than I do, that means the cost of borrowing will be cheaper and everybody's expenses will be lower and the state will be in a better position. Okay, interesting, interesting. So, given that, uh, there, there, there was tremendous pressure last year to, to have that almost as a ballot initiative. In fact, we were very surprised that it didn't make it. If it goes there, would you, uh, you know, and again, you'd campaign against it, obviously, but what if it passes on the ballot? We're broke. Look at Illinois. We're yeah. broke. I mean, that's that's what happens because this is this is the these are the numbers. The full pension payment is five billion dollars. The full health care payment is ten billion dollars. Now I know I'm a lawyer. You guys are the accounts. Don't hold me to the numbers, but that adds up to fifteen billion dollars. And the revenue, the the budget is only thirty five billion dollars. So some of the candidates you're hearing this year are doing the following. I'm going to fully fund free pre-K. I'm going to fully fund the school funding formula for K through 12. I'm going to give you free college education. This particular candidate might have already um, spoken before the group. And I'm going to fully fund the pension. I will tell you the same thing I told the NJEA when I went to screen with them. Not possible. If somebody tells you they're going to fully fund the pension, in ballot question or not, and then and also when you fully fund a pension, you have to fully fund the health care benefits. Uh, they're lying to you. Okay, staying on the business landscape, a major concern for New Jersey is our business abuses, uh, abusive lawsuits. Um, I think we have not had any tort reform for a month of Sundays, as my dad was saying, <laughs> but uh, last was probably in the mid 90s. One of the things New Jersey is known for is a very litigious state. And certainly I, it's a part of the equation when companies think about coming here. If you're governor, would you look to uh, try to change that and, and institute tort reform or entertain tort reform? It was supposed to be uh, one of the major items on, on Governor Christie's agenda. It but was. It said, but it certainly hasn't 
hasn't, hasn't happened. One in particular that is very uh, important to CPAs is uh, something called appeal bond caps. In um, approximately 39 states, almost 40 states, we have a tobacco cap here. If you remember when the tobacco industry and everybody would turn around when somebody died who had been smoking for 40, 50 years and they wanted to sue the tobacco companies, well, the tobacco companies would go away. Well, here in New Jersey, anytime, and it's a very, uh, talk about arcane, it's a very arcane law that's on the books that in order to appeal a lower court decision, you have to put up collateral equal to that amount with some of the pharma industry and, and uh, uh, financial services organizations, multi, multi-million dollar suits. It drives companies out of business. So, would you be, what, would you want, look to entertain tort reform to try to address that issue? Because I'm sure it's an issue, and we've heard it, is why, whether companies come here or not. Right. And, and, and certainly right. have. Certainly, as we've, uh, as I've traveled around outside of the state of New Jersey for years, one of the one of the factors they um, evaluate, and then anybody that knows any site selectors, when a company is going to move, there's a site selector that's usually hired, and they check, they go down the checklist, and one of the items on the checklist is not just the cost of living in New Jersey, but also the cost of surviving as a business in New Jersey, and that always comes down to tort reform. So yes, it was on w one of the governor's 88 ways, but the problem is the legislature is in the hands of the Democrats. So quite frankly, um, I, I'd be pandering to you if I could tell you that we would get tort reform through the legislature. You can do some things, and some of you might have read the most recent, there was something in the, in the newspapers a couple of days ago about the cost of litigation to municipalities. Um, people, everybody suing everybody in municipalities, and the lawyers get a recovery of eighty-seven thousand dollars for their client, but the legal fees are like, like mm -hmm. eight times that amount. So there's a lot of conversation now about the cost to municipalities because that's really the cost to the taxpayers, right? But um, unless you change the legislature, I don't see that happening. If tort reform got to my desk, cer certainly, certainly. And, and we could study tort reform, but we know where the problems are because you just look to the 39 other states and take their legislation and present it to our um, legislator and, and legis le legislate. Tours. Yes, yes, legislate tours. Find somebody to put their name on it that's going to get 41, 21, and 1. It's 41 assembly people, 21 senators, and then a governor who will sign it, which I, and I would. I just don't think you're going to get the votes. So um, some trees you just can't bark up. You know, you can't. We had a question that came in about us asking you to expand upon your proposed solution for the school for funding formula. Could you share with us your thoughts of how you would equalize that? Okay, well, there's two parts of it. One is the immediate one, which is the circuit breaker based on 5% of your household income. And um, I probably have a notebook here. If you gave me the name of your town, I could show you what my numbers show you could save. Not every town would save. And it's based on median incomes because those were the only numbers I had. I don't have your household income. I only have what the estimated household income is. So the first piece is the circuit breaker. That's the one that helps the people that need the most help right away. Um, that's the one I believe is the most likely to get passed through a legislature. Um, the second one is long-term fix for the school funding formula. And there's a lot of problems in that formula right now. I'll give you, you know it needs to be fixed when the following happens. Anybody here from Phillipsburg? Good. Well, bad, actually, because... Phillipsburg is way up in Sussex County, and up until this past year, Phillipsburg's children for 30 years, 30 years, were taught high school algebra in trailers and every other class in their high school in trailers. They had no high school. So at the same time these kids were going to school in trailers, in Neptune Township, five miles from my house, they had AstroTurf on their football field, they did, and a state-of-the-art aquatic center. Now, if that doesn't tell you everything that is the matter with our school funding formula, nothing will. Um, but it gets worse. I know in my town every five years we have a reevaluation. Jersey City hasn't had a reevaluation in 30 years. That reevaluation changes your formula when it comes to school funding. And if you are, in, as Jersey City is, 
a Abbott district or are formerly known as Abbott district, then they never have to pay more in taxes because they never had a reevaluation. And they keep getting more of our money. So, and, and, and add on top of that, in the business world, the billions of dollars we've given them in tax credits to bring J.P. Morgan Chase over and UPS over, UBS over, Fidelity over, and all of those other companies, and they're giving away pilots, which means they're giving away our money to these companies. Um, it's not fair. It's not providing a thorough and efficient, efficient education. So that's where the battle is right now. That's where, quite frankly, I was happy to see uh, Senate President Sweeney draw the line because now, now there will be a fix. We may not like the fix. The problem with the fix is this. It's going to take two to five years in litigation because once you get 41 assembly people, 21 senators, a governor to sign it, you need four. After that, you need four Supreme Court justices. This is where I get a little wonky as a lawyer because they need to decide. You're definitely going to get sued. I mean, that's just the nature of the formula. And it, it needs, it, you need to be able to get, uh, make a record that's strong enough to survive a Supreme Court challenge. There's one other piece of it that's kind of unfair that I think we could fix right now. Two other pieces we could fix right now. There's something called adjustment aid. The governor, whoever the governor is, gets $560 million to dole out to 180 districts. There's about 560, maybe 600 districts. We, of the 180 districts, 120 of them are overfunded, yet they still get part of this $560 million worth of adjustment aid, including Jersey City and Hoboken. I would zero out the Jersey City money right now. I'd zero out the Hoboken money right now. I'd go through and find out which, which other districts were. Um, and that doesn't mean you zero out school funding. The kids still get their money. This is money on top of that that they're getting to, that was designed to equal out the funding formula that John Corzine signed in 2008, but it was never rolled. Uh, it never went away. And it never changed. Um, the other problem with the school funding formula is the hold harmless piece. There's a school down in Salem right now that has lost 50% of its population in the school. But since 2008 when the governor Corzine signed the school, uh, the school funding formula back then. Since then, in the last nine years, they have lost 50% of their student population. People have moved out, haven't come back. But because of this hold harmless provision, they get the same amount of money they were getting in 2008. Don't you wish you could do that? That's ridiculous. It's ridiculous on its face. You as CPAs, I have no doubt, recommend that your clients do a review on a regular basis. Could be two years, could be five years, could even be 10 years, or could be all three. But it certainly isn't 30 years. We need to go back and, and, and eliminate the hold harmless right now. There are kids in freehold with 50, 50 kids in the classroom who have not gotten any more money in the last nine years. Yet there are kids down in Salem County who have lost 50% of their population and have, have gotten the same amount of money in the last nine years. Come on. It's not, it's, it's not rocket science. You guys could all figure it out right away. You want to make sure the kids that need the money get the money. You want to make sure the special, ed, uh, special education kids get the money they need in order to get the right services that they need. I mean, I'm a mom. I have three kids. One's 24 now, but he went, you know, he went through public school for part of his career. Um, one's 21 now, and one is 16. Um, nobody's going to walk away from these kids. What we need to do is walk towards those kids that are not getting the money that they need now, no matter what district they're in. And that will actually also lower your property taxes. That, has, that is a secondary benefit to that school funding formula. New Jersey's an interesting landscape in that it has 560 school districts and uh, municipalities, county government, et cetera. There's been a lot of conversation about how do we, con is there a way to consolidate that and make the state more efficient? But there's also the resistance by the, the residents to, to do those things. What, will you, in your future plans or your vision as governor, would you look at consolidation as 
or shared services as a strategy to help make the state more efficient? Right. It's a, there's no silver, uh, silver bullet. There's no quick fix. But you have to do more shared services. I live in a little tiny town. It's got 1,800 people on a sunny day in the summertime. Um, and it's on a little tiny strip of property within a little tiny strip of land um, that got devastated by Sandy. I mean, literally, the, the school was wiped out by Sandy. And the school had 300 students, a principal, a vice principal, a superintendent, a vice superintendent, a business administrator, and a full law firm to, to service the school, and a board of elections, and a little tiny municipal town like me. I had 10 cops, which was ridiculous too, but that's another story. The school was devastated by Sandy. Perfect opportunity. You didn't have to fight anybody in the town. It was gone. For two years, it was gone. All you had to do was leave those kids where they were. You know, and you know, K through two going one place. I'm not sure what the exact details were. And three through six going someplace else. And seven and eight going to a back, empty hallway at the high school. But instead, they rebuilt it with all of the bureaucracy that goes with it. So you're right about home rule. That one I, I lost completely. They called me up on the phone and said, "Can we get some emergency funding?" I said, "What for?" He said, "Well, for the boiler." I said, "For what boiler?" And he said, "For the school." I said, "You are asking the wrong question." You should be asking, why do we have to rebuild the school in the first place? And they just weren't going to go there because everybody thinks the quality of their schools is tied to the value of their property and that they like their small town school. They like to have their hands on it. I understand all that. But the time has come where we have to start making those harder decisions. Um, of course, now the school is brand new. so we probably won't be getting rid of the, that school for a while, but that's the kind of th pushback you're up against. Um, the other kind of pushback is this. Every single town wants its own um, fire truck. And uh, uh, having been the head of Commissioner of Roads, if you don't buy the fire truck or the ambulance, people will die. That's always the line. If you're a council person, that's always the line. And I said, wait a minute. Long Branch is literally spitting distance over there, and they got three fire trucks and a bunch of EMTs and some paid firemen. Seabright, um, and they've rebuilt after the storm. Same thing. They have pumper trucks. They have firemen. They have paid firemen, I think. Um, and they had EMTs. So why can't we share? Does somebody have cooties? I mean, is there a problem here somewhere? So you're getting the sense of how I feel about shared services. But I think you'll see things like uh, Lake Como and Belmar. When Lake Como, the people of Lake Como were up against a $700,000 tax increase because of their police department, they opted to go with Belmar. And you know what? They're right next to each other. It used to, Lake Como used to be called West Belmar, and then they changed the name. That's how close they are. I haven't heard of anybody complaining about the the combination of the two towns. So it's going to take time. We're very, very proud of our home rule. We should eliminate civil service obstacles for that. We should incentivize um, shared services. We should right size some of our um, fire police schools um, in a way that satisfies the community. It's got to come from the community up because otherwise it's not going to work. Okay, and I think we have maybe time for one more question. And that question is, we've talked a lot about tax proposals and the fact, in fact, on your website, you, you comment about how our folks are leaving New Jersey. Beyond taxes, what other priorities would you look to implement or address to keep folks in New Jersey? Well, you have to, the first is, 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 is actually taxes. I mean, yeah. it's, you've yeah. got to audit Trent and you've got to give them confidence that their money is being spent in the way it should be spent. And I've suggested through the audit and independently elected attorney general. You have to give them um, hope that their taxes are actually going to go down in the most tax state in the country. So those are really the key. But at the end of the day, it's, it's hope, right? It's jobs. It's good quality jobs for those that want them and the kind of jobs that they, they want to work in. So that's hope. And the good part about that is, from my perspective, and again, in a campaign, people don't like to talk about hope. They don't like to, campaigns are forward looking. They like to bash the guy behind them and look forward to um, how they would change things. But you know, last year in New Jersey, we had 103,000 businesses file to 
start their lives here. 103,000 businesses filed to start their lives here. That's good for you because that means you guys are always going to have a job. Because as these companies grow in New Jersey, they're going to stay in New Jersey. Because if you decide to come to New Jersey at the get-go, then clearly there's a reason they want to be here. And that's the hope. That's the part of this campaign that I think we should talk more about. Um, we need to get good quality jobs. Not every, and I can say this because I have a teenager who fits this one, not every kid needs to go to college. But every kid needs a job that he's going to love that pays him or her a livable wage. And that's what our goal has to be. That's our aspirational goal for, for New Jersey. The quality of life, all tied to jobs. There is no one in this campaign who knows more about creating those jobs than the person who's sitting in this chair right now. Thank you. I was gonna go one, when you started talking about a livable wage, uh, what to mind the minimum wage uh, proposals that are on and the mandatory paid sick leave, but we'll we'll leave that for another day. Oh, good. Then I get to come back. <laughs> you might but, hear some of it at the debates. Okay, great. Well, certainly want to thank you. I want to thank you for uh, work out of the Red Tape Commission. Uh, it's certainly a proposal. One of the initiatives that came out of there were changes to the administrative code for uh, professional ocu occupational and professional boards because we had an, uh, an archaic rule that if you let your CPA license expire for five years, you had to retake the CPA exam. Oh. And now that's gone. <laughs> so we thank you that that came out of the Red Tape <laughs> Commission. Uh, let's give a round of applause to the Lieutenant Governor. And we have something, a little keepsake, that uh, uh, I don't think violates any protocol, but something for you to remember us by for being with us here today. Thank you so very much for your time today, and good luck in the primaries. And we'll look forward to working with you or whoever's in, in that spot come January 2018. Well, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks, everybody. Thank you.